Hey, this is Man Made Mead. Today I am going to be answering the five most common mead questions that I see um, in my YouTube comments and from other people. So uh, as somebody who's been making mead for a while, I've noticed these questions in my um, in my own <laughs> mead making, but then also uh, just commonly seeing this is these are issues we all go through. So um, down below, I do have a link for some notes. If you want to look at those, those can be separate. You can just look at them, print them off, and read them yourself, or um, you can read them as well, this is going along. So now, uh, no, question number one is: Should I put my fruit into the primary or secondary? And how long should I leave it in? Um, this is something that there's a lot of debate about. Ultimately, um, some people believe, you know, primary is better, secondary better, wh whatever. I'm going to give you my opinion. Here's what I know and I understand. Uh, determining what fruit uh, you put into your mead depends on the flavor profile you want. So if you put it into the primary, um, you're going to get a certain uh, flavor profile. Often that flavor profile uh, is, is changed in the primary by losing the aromaticness of those fruit because the heavy fermentation that happens in the primary blows off or gases off that um, the flavors of the of the excuse me fruit so now if you put it into the secondary you still lose a little bit of that because there's some fermentation however um, there's uh, you can kind of leave the fruit in for a little longer, um, I'd say, because there's an alcohol content available for the yeast to, uh, for the fruit to like sit in and not get moldy or anything like that. So um, primary, you still keep the flavor profile of the fruit, but you lose the aromaticness of it. And then secondary, you lose a little bit of the aroma. Um, however, however, it's not as much. Um, and you... Ultimately, every fruit's different, so some fruits might do better in the primary while others do better in the secondary. There's not a cut and dry, you know, blueberries do better in the primary, whatever. Um, it's a lot of experience. I've had different experiences with it, and I think you just have to try it in order to really um, see what you like, ultimately. So, uh, primary, I per personally put mine into the secondary most of the time. I've done more with primary recently just to see and test, but secondary is where I put mine in, and I suggest... Uh, to everyone who asked me that, put it in the secondary because you can leave it in for longer. Now, talking about leaving it in, you can leave your fruit in, or you should, in my opinion, leave it in for about at least 45 days. Uh, what this does is it allows for those fruit flavors to really get involved inside the, um, the mead so you don't have to worry so much about the... Uh, some fruits have tannins, and tannins are like these... Uh, it's a very much so a wine thing, but the tannins of a fruit um, change the mouthfeel. And so if you know anything about drinking me, drinking wine, anything like that, mouthfeel is how, um, how it feels in your mouth. Is it heavy? Is it light? Does it feel is it smooth? Things like that. So those tannins affect a lot. If you leave fruit in too long, sometimes the tannins can really affect it. If you don't leave fruit in long enough, sometimes you just don't get the flavor you want. So I leave mine in for 45 days. I put mine in the secondary, leave it in for 45 days, and then I'm good. Um, now, next question, question number two. I often see people say, my meat has been going for a couple days, has no activity, or they say, my meat has been going and stopped really quickly. What should I do? In this case, you kind of have to provide more information. Realistically, there are a bunch of different things that could be happening and a lot of people want like that I want to know exactly what's happening with my meat and we do here's what you need to think about before you get in there um, there's the the first thing is is that you need to check your container to see if uh, if there's any leaks now one thing that often people run into with uh, fermentation buckets is they don't seal super well meaning Ultimately, there's, there is fermentation happening, and it's going out of the bucket, but it's not going through the airlock. And so then people think, well, it's not going through the airlock. It's not working. That's not true. It just might be going through a different venue or avenue. Excuse me. If you're using a glass carboy, it doesn't really have anywhere else to go but the airlock. That's a different story. So check your bucket and see if you have any leaks. If there's not a good seal on it, ultimately, you're not going to see that fermentation. Uh, you need to check the temperature of your mead and see if it falls um, 
in the range of that yeast. So for if your yeast is like has to ferment between 50 and 75, you need to keep it in that range. If it is above that, that yeast won't work. It'll struggle quite a bit. If it's below that, that yeast will struggle. So um, you want to make your yeast have the easiest time possible by ultimately just giving them the easiest time possible, giving them the temperature range they need. Um, and that affects both sides of the question. My mead has, um, is not, has no activity or my mead has stopped quickly. It could be that the yeast are too stressed to start or they're too stressed and they didn't make it through in the end. Uh, next thing you need to look at, review the steps for starting your yeast. When you rehydrated them, did you, um, did you give them you know, any extra nutrients to where they have something to hold on to? They need nutrients to start the process. There are, are nutrients in honey. However, they're, um, giving the yeast more nutrients gives them a greater opportunity. So stuff like Fermade K uh, or Go Firm Protect or just yeast nutrient or anything like that are going to be really helpful for you ultimately, um, to give those yeast the, the greater opportunity to live. Um, so let's see. And then the last part of that, when you rehydrated them or, um, you know, tried to activate them in general, did you heat up the water too much? If they got heated too much, then the yeast might not have survived and could have died immediately. Um, so don't overheat the water. Make sure it's just within the packet range. So most lav, most Lauvin products say 105 to 109, and that's where you're supposed to uh, hydrate them. Um, so review those steps. What did you do to start your yeast? Did you just throw it into the mead? Did you acclimate it at all? Did you give the yeast a chance to really figure it out, or did they just kind of start and go, and next thing you know, they're they're dead because they didn't have a great opportunity to um, to get going. Next one, check for any odd smells. If you have any odd smells like sulfur or just really anything that doesn't smell good, there could be something going wrong, meaning there's a bad yeast that has taken over and that yeast is fighting against your normal yeast and they're kind of, you know, most of the time the bad yeast does kind of take over and that's where you get in trouble with that. And the last one of my meads not working um, is what ingredients did you use? If you used, if you're doing fruit mead stuff, sometimes our, um, our fruits can uh, affect how the yeast works. So like if you're using heavily acidic things or fairly acidic, like a uh, citrus, so oranges or, uh, lemon, lime, stuff like that. Those yeast have a hard time metabolizing those sugars and sometimes can fight. And it takes a while longer, stresses them out to where they don't work as well. And the same thing goes for a boche. If you caramelize the honey, there are certain sugars um, that, you know, caramelizing those sugars makes it harder for them to metabolize them. And so they, their fermentation goes slower. Those are some, just a few of the little problems you could see. The big thing is there's no cut and dry uh, ultimate like, well, this is happening. I can't, most people can't say unless you know exactly. So whenever you ask these questions, you need to know these information. You need to know what's happening there. Um, one other bit of information that will help you is knowing the gravity of your mead. When you ask this question, so you can tell people, hey, my mead isn't starting, it's been five days. The gravity was this when I started. I used these ingredients and this is the temperature. It's been fermenting yet. Give all those steps and people can give a little troubleshooting um, you know, stuff for you to know what's happening. But if you just say, my mead's not working, what's happening? It doesn't work. We can't give you that information. We can't help you out unless we have more information. Okay. Next, um, should I heat my honey before mixing it into my water? This is another big debate question because some people do it and they have great success. Other people do it, don't do it, and they have great success. So we kind of meet in the middle and say, what, what do you mean? And what's the difference between the two? So the quick answer for this is no. You don't want to heat the honey. Yeah, but let me explain real fast. Um, when you heat the honey, you are, especially to certain degrees, you are caramelizing certain sugars. In honey, there are multiple different kinds of sugars. The, what's important that we know is the different, I mean, you don't need to know the exact points of caramelization for each thing, but if you know that at 170 degrees, glucose uh, caramelizes, well, you don't want to push your honey that far. So what people will do 
is they often will heat their honey too much, which makes it mix in the water well, great, but you're taking away those those certain sugars and sometimes you're burning those sugars to where they're not actually there anymore. Um, so don't heat your honey above 150 uh, Fahrenheit or 65 degrees Celsius. When you do that, like I said, you can risk messing with the honey and the, the um, flavors. Also, honey has a medicinal property to it. So heating it takes away that medicinal property sometimes. What I do instead, and this is why I suggest, I've had success just putting my honey in into a glass carboy and water and shaking it and it mixes just fine. It's great. Um, or if you want to heat it up a little bit, I'll take and put warm water into my sink and then I'll put my container in and then let that set, mix it all together and it's good. I would not suggest heating your honey. Don't heat your honey. That will help you greatly. Next question is, how long do I wait before I can drink my mead? The, the short answer for, the, for this is the longer, the better, because mead gets better with age, and it's just like wine in that way that um, a lot of times uh, a good wine will age, taste better with age. Now, that's not the same. A bad mead is not going to taste better with age all the time. Sometimes certain flavors will mellow out and it'll get better, but... Um, the big thing is you, you just need to test, taste test it along the way if you can and see if uh, it's changed at all. So what I do is I will actually um, let my meads, my standard is to let them sit for nine months before I will start drinking them for real. Now that means that during the process leading up to it, what I'll do is um, I'll do a little taste test and see where it's at and see like, oh, is this flavor mellowed out? Is this getting better? And you'd be surprised to see the different flavors change over time. But nine months is my standard for how long to wait before I drink my mead. It takes a while, but if you have a good stock going, meaning you start one and you start another one, you can start building up. Next thing you know, you've got yourself a bunch of mead and you can start drinking it and it works. So I wait nine months. For you, this is just based on your tasting. So not everybody needs to wait that long. If you want to drink it at six months, go for it. If you want to drink it at three, it might not be as good as it would be later, but that doesn't mean it's still that it's going to be bad. So um, if you want to follow me, nine months. If you want to do your own thing, that's great. Generally, the longer you can wait, the better. And number five, how much honey do I need for a sweet mead and how much sugar or honey do I need to use when back sweetening? So this is also another deep question because it depends on a lot of variables. If you, you need to account first of all, um, your yeast. What kind of yeast are you using? And what is their alcohol tolerance? Certain yeast or different yeast have different alcohol tolerances. So for example, excuse me, if I used a Lalvin D47, that yeast has a alcohol tolerance of 14% meaning that I, um, when I put my, my honey in, if I put in up to that gravity point worth of honey, it's going to completely dry out all of the honey from the meat. So I, off the top of my head, I don't know what 14% is, but let's say it's 1.12. If it's 1.12 and I put that much gravity, or I put that much honey to equal that gravity, I get a dry meat. So what you have to do is put more than that alcohol tolerance because the yeast will, they can't uh, metabolize the sugar past that alcohol point. They'll struggle and most of the time will not, just won't be able to do it. So what you do is you base your honey on the amount of like gravity to go over. So let's say you wanted a sweet mead and you're using that Lauvin D47. I would put in, let's say, 1.16 gravity worth of honey. Now, I don't know exactly how much that is off the top of my head, meaning pounds, but let's say that's about four pounds. Four pounds of honey for a gallon of water, and that will get me a sweet mead naturally, which is great. A lot of people do that. People even go sweeter, and that's all right, too. Um, so that's for that yeast. Now, the problem is... That changes with other yeast. When you use a yeast with a higher tolerance, you have to use even more honey to get that naturally sweet mead without back sweetening. So when you're gauging how much honey to use, you need to think about your, um, your percentage you want if you don't want to back sweeten. If you're back sweetening, that's a totally different story, and we're about to talk about that. But 
when if you want to naturally sweet mead without vac sweetening, you need to go over the cap um, of the alcohol tolerance of your yeast. Now, if you have questions about that, ask me below and I'll try to answer those um, about yeast and help you with that. Now, talking about back sweetening, there are lots of different ways to back sweeten. Um, and the big thing is you want to make sure your fermentation has stopped before you back sweeten. If you back sweeten, oftentimes the yeast will kick back up and they'll start going again. It depends on, uh, also depends on what you want to do. If you want to bottle carbonate your yeast, or excuse me, your mead, then that's okay for that yeast to kick back up because you can back sweeten, bottle it, and then you'll get a little carbonation naturally. If you don't want carbonation, you have to kill your yeast and stop them. So you're going to use, um, you're going to use potassium sorbate or uh, potassium meta, I'm going to mess this up, metabisulfite. Um, if you use those two things, those will stop and slow the yeast. The mix of the two will kill the yeast and keep them from reproducing and going any further. You want to do that before you back sweeten. You don't want to do that and then back sweeten because then you get weird flavors and they mix and it's not good. So two weeks before you want to back sweeten, I would put those things in, Camden tablets, meta, meta, uh, excuse me, potassium sorbate and um, potassium metabisulfite. You want to put those things in and that will um, stop the yeast, then back sweeten. Now in your back sweetening stages, you can add a couple different sugars. I tend to like to add my honey back in to keep the natural flavors of the honey there and that works well. Um, you can also do just regular sugar. You can do uh, various other sugars. There are a bunch, a bunch of different sugars you can use that work well. Stevia, um, and then there's actually one more trick you can do, and I didn't mention this a moment ago. If you want to back sweeten without killing your yeast, then you can use um, Splenda. And Splenda will, I'm not a big fan of this because I don't, I don't really like Splenda. I don't like the flavor of it. Um, I, I don't know if I want to do this or not, but I, this is something, an option for you if you want to try it. You can use Splenda and put Splenda into your mead and that will go in there and the, the yeast cannot metabolize, in the sh metabolize the sugars in that Splenda. Now that seems sketchy to me to that they can't metabolize it because really we can't metabolize it very well either. Um, it's, you know, it's a fake sugar. So I'll just be careful with that. If you want to try it, try it. My suggestion when back sweetening is using honey. Now gauge it to taste. There's no set, set and dry like one cup per one gallon because maybe you want a sweeter side of a mead. Then you need to put more. If you want just a semi-sweet, then you need to put just a little bit. You need to mix it in into your mead, stir slightly, you know, stir around, and then also um, and just taste it and see from there. So in the uh, jumping around, sorry, I mentioned one more thing about back sweetening. Another option for killing the yeast, I should have said this a moment ago, is to heat the honey to pasteurize, or excuse me, to uh, kill off the yeast. So you don't want to heat it, heat the mead. You don't want to heat the mead too much. Otherwise, you'll create off flavors. This is also not a preferred technique in my opinion, um, but it does work. So uh, to review, we have our five questions. Our five questions are... Number one, should I put my fruit into the primary or secondary and how long should I leave it in? My meat has been going for a couple days, no activity, um, or stop quickly, what should I do? Should I heat my honey before mixing into my water? How long do I wait before I can drink my mead? And how much honey do I need to, for a sweet mead? Uh, how much sugar or, um, or how do I back sweeten? Those things. So hopefully you, you um, receive some answers about some of these things. These are questions that I see quite a bit and they're, they are weird questions because you have to understand how yeast operate and how sugars and yeast and nutrients and all these things combine. So if I miss something, feel free to let me know in the comments and I will try to add it to a next video. Um, hopefully I've helped you in some form or fashion. My goal is to, like I said, make mead and then also help educate people in, into making mead. If you want to support me in my endeavors and help me buy more honey and make more videos and do these things, you can help buy my merchandise. I have lots of shirts. Here's one of my shirts. And I've also got things like stickers and this is a like a beer can koozie. 
Ultimately, these are on my Society6 shop. You'll see down below. I have a Facebook. I have Instagram. I have Twitter. Um, Facebook is at Manmade Meadery. And then uh, Twitter and Instagram are at Manmade Mead. I've got a Patreon. I've got a million links. Go check them out. Let me know or join those things if you want to. I will gladly... Um, I want to talk to you guys and see if I helped you in some way or continue to answer your questions. Um, like I said, if I miss something, let me know in the comments. If you have extra things to help inform people, let's help people make better mead. That's the ultimate goal of this channel, this community. So thank you guys for watching and I will see you guys in another video. Bye.